we are here at the house of Ken Reed watching Zombie Nightmare, MST's Zombie Nightmare. And in just a couple of days, you're going to debut your new show, Firsts of Fury. Correct. At Motley's Comedy Club uh, on Thursday. What is the, uh, the main concept behind the show? Uh, so it's a storytelling show, uh, as many of my shows have been. In fact, all of them. <laughs> Uh, but this one is different because it's not just me um, mm. incorporating some other people into it. So mm. uh, it's a storytelling theme show. I'm kind of hosting it, doing some stories, and also kind of curating it, I say, instead mm. of booking it. Uh, and it's just uh, the theme is firsts. It's a very mm. wide open theme. So it would just be people telling stories about their first whatever, anything. And some of the guidelines I gave people was, could be anything from... You know, the first movie you saw in the theater to the first time you realized your parents are human beings. Like that wide mm -hmm. of a range of things, as concrete or as abstract as you would want to get. Mm -hmm. um, that's just an interesting, funny story. So, What gave you the idea for firsts? Uh, I always feel like those are things everyone tends to remember and they are kind of, are kind of always imbued with meaning. Mm. regardless of whether they should be or not. Uh -huh. And so they're almost always an interesting thing. Those are the things that people sort of mark their lives as a series of firsts in mm. a lot of ways, or lasts, but usually don't notice that till much later after the fact. But uh, in our general age group, it's usually a series of firsts, and I feel like uh -huh. that's kind of what makes somebody. Mm. They're kind of made up of a series of first experiences. Mm. Even if it's something you do a million times, the first time always is somewhat memorable and is usually somewhat entertaining or amusing. Mm -hmm. Do you have a particular first that, that you uh, want to, to mention? Not to give away what you're going to say at the actual uh, show. I'm going to be telling a couple stories. I'm going to be telling <coughs> the first time that I... The first, I'm going to be telling my whole first year in school. Mm -hmm. So that's going to have a lot of little mini odd things, uh, including when I was at ESL. Uh, which should be odd <laughs> since English is my first language, but I'll get into why that was in. Um, I'll be showing some clips from my first produced screenwriting uh, example. Uh -huh. So that'll be exciting. I want, I want to ruin that one. People will be shocked and amused by that one. Uh -huh. um, and that's probably it for mine. Uh, oh, I had a blast. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, those and John Michael John Michael Thor, Thor, who is also in one of our favorite movies, Rock and Roll Nightmare. Yes, which, uh, career. Yeah, my wife and I are our, our New Year's Eve tradition mm. is that we watch um, John Michael Thor's Rock and Roll Nightmare every New Year's Eve, so that it ends right at midnight. Uh. And the movie has nothing to do with New Year's Eve at all, but we do that every year, and I don't even know why. When was your first time doing that? Four years ago, maybe. Uh. Four, yeah, so I'd say New Year's Eve 2007. I think oh. was the first time we did that. And uh, we've done it every year. I don't think it's a tradition that's going to go beyond us as much as we try to impress upon people how mm. awesome it is to do You that. won't be having the, the uh, rock and roll nightmare party at all. No, we've, we've right. invited people over to do it. And everyone's uh. like, oh, I'm going to go to an actual party. Or I want to get drunk and kiss people. Mm. <laughs> well, we're going to be watching rock and roll nightmare and mm. eating pizza. Screenplay played by David Wellington, actually, who's a fairly accomplished zombie novelist. Oh, is it the same one, you think? Yeah, I think I'm pretty sure it would be the, the same one. Because he must have been slumming it because the Monster Nation guy. Well, this movie, actually, the guy who got credit for the screenplay <coughs> didn't actually write it. And the guy mm -hmm. who directed this movie didn't actually direct it. This guy, John Fersano, actually did it. Uh -huh. but they shot it in Canada under the tax shelter. And so he's not Canadian, so they couldn't use his credits. He's actually <coughs> in the movie. Uh, and the, that's him there. That's the guy that wrote and directed this movie. Uncredited, John Fersano. Uh -huh. That's his son. Uh -huh. Well, at least he gets to, to say he was in a movie. Right, exactly. Wearing that wearing sweatpants. Flattering, flattering. Yes. He was not the costume designer of the movie. No. So you also host at the comedy studios now on a yep. monthly basis. Yep, so every Friday I'm hosting at the comedy studio now. Mm -hmm. uh, I was doing every other Friday for a couple of years, but it's, yeah, every Friday now. So that's fun. <coughs> it's a lot different you know, from because I have to try to rein in my self-indulgent uh, story stuff because uh, I forget that I'm sort of in charge of making sure everyone has a good time uh, and that thing goes smoothly <laughs> and ends on time, uh, which is, is a good skill set for me to practice. Uh, do you have, is there a particular vibe that you're shooting for for Fridays? Because there, there's a tradition of, of you know, Fridays and Saturday nights at the, right, at the yeah. studio. It's a really intimidating tradition as well. Um, yeah, I try to have it be... I mean, it's always going to be the studio. I think the studio is sort of unique in that 
I don't think they ever have to advertise who's on. People just mm. go because of it, because it's the studio, which is sort of the opposite of any other club. Uh -huh. Who's on? They just say, oh, it's the studio. We're going to go to the comedy studio. So you can't put too much of a stamp on it, but I like to try and have it be somewhat of a relaxed vibe. And I do do a lot of story stuff just because that's what my act is like. Mm. And also just kind of have it be linked together more. Like I try to actually watch the show and interact <laughs> with it a little bit when I'm in it, when I'm up and down so that people kind of have a not a party atmosphere where it's sort of a relaxed like oh we, we're just hanging out and listening to people kind of thing which I think is what the studio goes for anyway mm -hmm. it's just that uh, I'm I'm hosting the party so it's, <laughs> it's, it's slightly more me but less uh, less stand up -y, hosty mm -hmm. than some other venues can be just because I don't have that skill set mm -hmm. And then uh, finally, I have somewhat of, of a surprise since I have, in print several times, vouched for your uh, pop culture abilities. I have the bag of pop culture oh, here nice. to reach in and grab random stuff and tell me what the tell me what it is first and what the the cultural significance okay. of it is. We'll All start right. with uh, I know one item that you'll want to. Oh, nice! The Doctor Who. This is the uh, the sonic screwdriver from the new Doctor Who, the Matt Smith Doctor Who. Yes. This is the redesign. Mm. Uh, this is pretty amazing. I have an old sonic screwdriver from the previous Doctor Who, which is uh -huh. a uh, which is also a pen. Yes. Uh, which is uh, this is pretty excellent. This is very significant. Uh, I haven't, actually haven't watched the Matt Smith one yet. Uh -huh. I have the Blu-rays. They're set aside, but I uh, I, I don't dislike him. Without mm -hmm. having seen it, so that's always good. But this uh -huh. is the redesign, which I, I'm okay with. Uh -huh. Normally, I don't like the redesign of the Sonic Screwdriver. What is it you're waiting for for the Matt Smith edition? Uh, I just haven't had. I have such a backlog of stuff, and I, uh -huh. I waited till I got them, and they've just been sitting on the shelf. And I'm like, because yeah, I usually want to watch it like all at once. Uh -huh. So I basically, just need like uh, to get an illness yes. or uh, an injury. This particular uh, season. Uh, is a good one to watch all at once. Well, all at once, yeah, that's what I've heard. It's very serialized, so. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe just a long weekend, mm. but soon. Okay. Very nice. Next item. Uh, Mr. James Corrigan, uh, The Spectre. Yes. Uh, the Wrath of God. Yes. Or uh, the, vo the Voice, as he's called in DC Comics, so yes. that they don't offend anybody. Uh -huh. uh, this is the glow-in-the-dark version. From, I'm guessing this is from 96, I'm going to guess, this DC Direct is from? 2000. I was a little bit off. Uh, this is before the Spectre got really awful when they made him into Hell Jordan. Yes. This is probably the worst idea they ever had for the Spectre. I agree. Uh, well, I, you know, the, he was being punished for not being able to defeat all the concentrated evil in the universe in right. the first crisis. Right, which was always a bad idea. Right. The crisis may have been the worst thing that ever happened in the DC Universe, aside from all the post-crisis attempts to undo crisis. I like the first crisis. It was but. good for what it was at the time. It was better than Secret Wars. <laughs> yes. But uh, Secret Wars was very disco. Yes. I thought. Secret Wars was more disco. Crisis was more prog rock. Yeah. It was had a much more a very cosmic good way of explaining layers that. involved. I actually really like the version of the Spectre that Alan Moore used on Swamp Thing. Mm. When the uh, when you went to hell and all that stuff, they yes, in a very good way. Swamp Thing Fifty. Yes, and there's also a very good uh, episode of the new Batman Brave and the Bold cartoon, which is more juvenile in general. Uh -huh. There's an episode where the Spectre and the Phantom Stranger make a bet about Batman's soul, uh -huh. <laughs> about what he'll do for like how vengeance is, and it's very very good. They're both like manipulating him to see like what he'll do. It's uh -huh. very good. It's, a, it's a much better take out. on the Spectre where he's just like, just a complete asshole. Okay, there's a couple more that, that are must, that uh, ah, are it's must for looking at. First of all, it's a VHS, which is uh, very important. Yes. Uh, Night of the Living Dead, excellent movie, one of my all-time favorites. Extremely important. Mm. Uh, I got to meet George Romero a couple times, which was very exciting for me. Dawn's probably uh, my preferred film now. Mm. But uh, we're to the point where I actually traveled to Monroeville, Pennsylvania, specifically to go to the Monroeville Mall where it was shot in, mm -hmm. and it was probably the closest thing I've ever had to a religious experience <laughs> in my life. Like, and it was weird because I've seen that movie hundreds of times, and I'd never been to this mall, but I knew where everything was. <laughs> and they're on this corner, we'll be this thing, and it was there. I didn't get to go on the uh, the tour from the Dead stuff because I guess it's like an hour outside of Pittsburgh where they shot that. Mm -hmm. um, 
But this this movie was very important. I remember I bought the Night of the Living Dead film book when I was four years old. Uh-huh. I had an Ocean City <laughs> job lot in Narragansett, Rhode Island. It's the first, <laughs> the first book I remember purchasing specifically. Sorry. And I read that so many times that it became ridiculous. Hmm. Okay, next, just grab something right. randomly from there. Stephen Wright, I Have a Pony. Oh, the Deluxe Anniversary Edition. Yes. Uh, this was the first comedian that I recognized as being from Boston. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I watched him on TV, and I was, and I didn't understand accents at the time. Uh-huh. And it, there was some people that just sounded like real people to me, uh-huh. <laughs> like the Tin Man from Wizard of Oz, <laughs> Stephen Wright, many people on People's Court. <laughs> it sounds like a real guy. Uh-huh. And I was like, oh, he's funny. He sounds like a real person. And it was because he had a Boston accent, and I found out he was from there. Uh-huh. Uh, one of my all-time favorites. Very, very fun. All right, next we'll do a couple more. All right, thank you. Uh, One Step Beyond, uh, the inferior Twilight Zone. Uh, <laughs> it still had some pretty good episodes. Uh, I always look at it as just like the public domain DVD staple. Uh, and it's always, <laughs> like, uh, it's always like Russian Roulette when I'm buying a DVD of One Step Beyond, because some of them are just complete garbage copies, and uh, some of them are really good, but you're like, oh, it's always in the dollar bin, uh, and it's probably the best thing in there. It's I better than Ozzy and Harriet episodes. Bought that at the library for at a dollar. Library. And of course, yeah. it's the classic TV series, that's the name of it. Yes. There is, a, there is an official version of this that came out from Warner Brothers uh, with like extras and stuff and like from that original elements, uh, but, which is cool, but then you're like, this is a dollar. Uh-huh. <laughs> just like, watch the same episodes. There's an episode of that where uh, Lon Chaney Jr. was uh-huh. really drunk because it was shot live. Uh-huh. And he thought it was a rehearsal. Uh-huh. And so he's playing like this monster and he's supposed to smash a thing. But he's like, ah! And then he just like puts it down very gently because <laughs> he thinks it's just the rehearsal. It's very funny. Uh-huh. It's, I forget what volume it's on, but it's well worth watching. Awesome. Yes. All right. Here we got Steve Martin never got into his comedy. Uh-huh. I never, I've never listened to a Steve Martin comedy album. I've oh. seen the specials, and I always liked him in movies, and I'm a mm. huge SNL fan. Ne- I've never listened to a Steve Martin album. I think you have to give it a shot sometimes. Yes, I, I've always meant to, but have not ever, for whatever weird reason. Mm. I have not. Alright, we got here. Uh, the Yellow Submarine uh, from the Beatles. Also never seen this movie. Also not a Beatles fan. Uh-huh. Everyone thinks I'm crazy. Never liked the Beatles. Mm. And uh, I don't know why. Just can't get into them at all. Mm. I was in. I was an angry punk rock youth. Uh-huh. Like, Beatles. Yeah. Uh, let's see if there's any. I'm not sure if I have the closest thing I have to angry punk rock youth is ah uh, the Pixies in this bag. Excellent boobs on the cover of this record. Uh, <laughs> Surfer Rosa. Surfer Rosa. Uh, when I purchased this, I was convinced I was going to be arrested. Uh. <laughs> I bought this record at Newbury Comics in Harvard Square, and I was I was like incredibly nervous. I must have been 10 or 11 years old. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I bought another CD to put on top of it when uh, I was purchasing it. It was a Chris Isaac CD. Uh, so that Wicked they, game, most probably. Uh, yes, it was like probably 91. So it was mm. uh, it was Heart Shaped World. Yes. Yep, with Wicked Game on it. And I was like, just in case they were like, you can't buy this. And I would be like, oh, it's an accident. I didn't mean to pick this up. Uh, it was pretty uh, hardcore for 10. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is such a great record that it was well worth it. And you purchase it at the wall. Yeah. And have you have you tried to make good on their lifetime music guarantee? <laughs> no, I don't think they exist no, anymore. No, they don't, but you could probably have a class action suit about them. Uh, well, we have the sticker to prove. Yeah, I think Tape World also had uh, <laughs> Tape World. Yeah, a lifetime music guarantee. Tape World, Tape Camelot was the one Camelot I used to music. buy. That's an upstate New York one. I used to, to buy it, which is probably similar to Tape World. Yeah, I would imagine. I feel like Tape World exists somewhere in in like one of those planets next to the the one where the, from the the Transformers the movie yes tape world where? I always thought of tape world because a, a guy some guy was at a mall and he was like record town <laughs> hey, get into the future buddy I'm gonna leave you to my desk with tape world and then he was so wrong now uh, CD spins is dying yes CD spins is dying now we'll just have I don't even know beam to your head yes yes intangible musical world let's see they're like couple more things left in here. Let's see. I think that one would be inexcusable not to address. Excellent. Purple Rain. Uh, possibly the greatest soundtrack album of all time. Yes. Uh, also an incredible movie. Uh, I thought 8 Mile was a much inferior remake. Mm-hmm. When I got, I got dragged on a date to go see 8 Mile. And I was like, yeah, we could just watch Purple Rain and not hear terrible music. <laughs> an awful movie with no likable characters. 
And also, who doesn't want to watch Morris Day on yes. screen at all times? Uh, Apollonia. He has a good today. brass water bed. Yes, he does. Yes, mm. uh, it's really a perfect film. Uh, uh. Never, it was it was a once in a lifetime opportunity to capture that magic. Uh. Under the Cherry Moon, no good. Mm. Uh, Graffiti Bridge, terrible. Uh. Purple Rain, amazing. I, I honestly listen to this soundtrack or portions of this soundtrack at least once a week, mm. mostly on a daily basis. <laughs> Literally two more things in here. I want to go through them quickly. Life of Brian, uh, possibly my favorite Monty Python movie. Uh, I agree. Most people say Holy Grail, but I, think I it's better prefer. than Holy Grail because I think Holy Grail ends up being like just a series of sketches with a theme, mm. and this has an actual story uh. in that format as well. Easily their best film. Mm. And last, maybe a little closer to the, the, ah, the punk excellent film. movie. Excellent movie. Excellent <laughs> disc. I, I'd spent many, many hours in high school listening to this record over and over. The Clash <laughs> London Calling. Yes, the Clash London Calling. Uh, also, uh, the first time I realized that punk rock didn't have to sound like punk rock. Uh -huh. <laughs> this is not actually a very punk rock sounding record. Uh -huh. If you think of like general punk rock stuff, it's mm. very, very. When I was in a punk rock band, when I was growing up, some of the guys in the band had a cover band called the Guns of Boston. Mm -hmm. And uh, they used to play this in its entirety, which mm -hmm. was always uh, kind of sad but impressive at the same time. Mm -hmm. And you had your one man show also about music. Yes, yes. I did. A, uh, my last one man show was all about music when I was in my punk rock band and, and whatnot. The Clash was a very important band. The only band that I ever really met, I believe, was The Quote. Mm -hmm. If we had to say it, might have been Lester Bangs or something like that. That sounds like. Yeah, The Clash was the only band that I ever met. Mm -hmm. Okay, so first of Fury. Yes. Thursday, Thursday at, 8 at o Motley's Comedy Club. Motley's Comedy Club. Uh, people on a first date get in free. Mm. Um, they'll be witnessing some firsts that mm. night. People telling firsts. I got uh, Mayron on, uh, Lamont Price, uh, Jenny Zagrino, and Mark Lind, who's not a comedian, he's a musician. Mm. But um, I'm kind of looking at it like a pilot episode, so I hope to do this show more frequently. Uh -huh. And I'm always going to try and book at least one non-comedian on the mm. show to tell uh, an interesting and mm. funny story. So. Great lineup for the first one. Yeah, it should be good. I think I, I stacked it well. Mm. People should be very entertained. <laughs> All right, Ken Reed, everyone. And back to Zombie Nightmare. Yes. We missed the whole first part now, and I'm lost. Oh, we can rewind. Yeah. <laughs> 